You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. We should wrote a letter to, is it Paul Burroughs in 96? It yeah. says that they were going to kill her yeah. in a car accident. Yeah. Was there, she ever in fear of her life? Did you ever feel that yeah, vibe? Yeah, she was. Everywhere you go, you're trying to make it as sterile as possible because there was massive threats against uh, the family and him, he brought down the government with the cash for questions carry on, which I was involved with. People who were watching you, and we did find people watching us, doing surveillance on us, uh, from um, MI5, which was standard, uh, and others. What you're hoping is they're going to look at your le level of security and they're going to go, no, nah, we can't get away with this, it's too much. You know, you've just got to see through all the bullshit, man. This is fucking insane. This is going to get everybody killed and I'm not sending my men in there. Some of the iconic pictures you see of the princess, there was one of me and her in a boat where she's whispering to me, that made it all over the world. Some of them sold for a million euros. So you can see why, why they were so aggressive to get in and get in your face and try and take a compromising uh, photo. And the question is, why did everybody love her? Because people could see what she was like. And the media, especially the media in the UK, the tabloids then, uh, just destroyed her. So I said to the princess, I said, have you seen the daily papers today? Because I wanted to just give her the heads up of, as to what was in. And she said, are you, are you meaning that article in that paper? And I said, yeah, like, are you okay with it? And she said, well, it's his choice. And she turned around, she'd obviously been crying and a lot. And uh, she said, have you heard about my, my friend? Um, and I said, yes, yeah, we have, you know, it's awful what's happened, you know, and you know, I know you knew him and I'm really sorry. And, and she was crying and she said, uh, do you think they're gonna do that to me? Because Mr. Fired, one of his big rules was everybody must wear a seatbelt. He was really big on it. And you can see on the pictures, he wasn't staggering drunk. He was expect, but he was made out to be pissed out of his head. And Trevor said to me, and, and, and Kez has said to me as well, he was not drunk. We would not allow him to drive. Yeah, there was rumours that she was pregnant, is there any? Um, how can I say? Boom, we're on. And today's guest, we've got Lee Sansom. Great to meet you, brother. How are you, big man? I'm good. Are you? Yeah, really good. Thank you. First of all, thanks for coming on the show. My pleasure. Thank you for just, having me on. Yeah, no problem. You just released a book called The Bodyguard. Great read. Close protection. Like You've worked with some of the biggest names on the planet, mm. but none other than Princess Diana. Yes, yeah, the, yeah. The biggest name probably on the planet. Yeah. you got to have... Uh, deep personal conversations with her um, your own opinion of the night of the crash like very fascinating read like, yeah I get a lot of books and a lot of guests but that one I read in two days wow very intriguing it's always something I've always remembered now we're 25th anniversary just passed a couple know, of days yes, ago I know but as a kid that's always something that's always stood out and there's a lot of speculation a lot of conspiracy theories but you're the man in the mix yeah but how are you I'm good I'm good good busy as always, like you, dashing about all over the show. But so yeah, yeah, everything's good, good and good. everything's good. Before we get into everything, I always go back to the start of my guests, where you grew up and how it all began. Okay, right. So, uh, yeah, the book, um, the book I wrote with my ghostwriter as a legacy, really, for my kids during lockdown. And and there are, there are th some things about the princess in there, but she's the big news, right? Everybody, especially the 25th anniversary. So I... Uh, I was born in Lancashire, just north of Manchester, and and lived you know most of my years there. We moved in, back into a place called Salford in Manchester, which is slightly different than it is today. It's a big, big working class area, and and mainly around the dock area. And and you know my dad used to work there, and and my family are all from Manchester. And so we, my parents moved out to a place called Rosendale in Lancashire, and they'd both been there during the war. You know, when they moved the children out, 
So they, they moved back there. They must have had really good memories of it, you know. So, uh, yeah, born on a big council estate. Uh, what do you call it in Scotland? Uh, a scheme. scheme. Yeah. yeah. Massive scheme. Thousands of people. Uh, full em employment then in the uh, in the, the cotton mills. And uh, it was a great place to to grow up, you know. Loads of pubs, um, big community feeling, as you get. And then there's the pecking order, of course, isn't there, as a young man on, on the schemes or on the uh, council estates. So you quickly established your pecking order as a young man. And then your little gangs that you hang out with would have their pecking order as, as well. So I think that uh, growing up in that environment affects everybody slightly differently, doesn't it? So uh, for me, uh, as a child, I was, uh, I think I was, you know, when you look back, I was quite thoughtful and, um, and perhaps uh, a bit too thoughtful on things, you know, and I was bullied at school uh, quite badly, uh, not, not in, in terms of, uh, of, you know, horrendous acts of violence against me. There's a few, but um, I think I, I overthought it, as you can do, you know. And uh, and that played a big part in my life, that. Um, on my paper, I'm dreading going to school, dreading meeting this person. You know, it affected my life incredibly. So I can really... I can really relate to people who've been bullied at school. You know, for me, it's more psychological, I think. I've, I've built it up myself, you know, uh and uh, so, but apart from that, I had a really good, happy childhood, exciting, getting up to lots of mischief as you do. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I went from there to uh, a karate school. So I thought, if I can learn this karate, I can sort this guy out. So uh, I went to the karate school in a place called Bay Cup, which is a really interesting place. There's a lot of Irish people settled in. Uh, in this place called Bay Cup. It was the last um, train line to be built and a lot of the navvies got laid off there. So there's friends of mine had Irish accents had never been there, you know, and there was a big, um, there was a big um, uh, community there. How can I say, um, supported the IRA, of course, because that's where they came from and that's their belief. And there's all the murals on the wall and everything, it's an incredible place. You'd only go there if you had a friend there and we didn't have any friends from there because it was just a really rough place. But the first karate school I went to was in this place called Bay Cup. So I was so determined to do it. So as the bus pulled up, I got off the bus, ran to the community center because I thought I was going to get battered by the, the young people there. And I probably was if I didn't run. There's a couple of us. And then it started getting worse then. So first night, there was, a, there was a, an instructor there and... Um, he delighted in beating you up and he broke my ribs on the first night of my karate. So that didn't work out too well for me. So um, a bit later on in life, I, uh, I started going to football matches and I used to support Manchester City, which was uh, my home team. And when I went to Rosendale, the, it wasn't the team to support, it was Burnley. He either supported Burnley or no one. So I started going watching Burnley and I didn't want to, but I soon got the bug for it. And uh, and it became my team. I went all over the the country watching them get beat, generally. <laughs> and, uh, and then got involved in football violence, which was a big kick for me because after all those years of being uncertain about, you know, your physical attributes and, you know, psychologically being bullied... But um, the, the turning point, a big turning point in my life, I've had a few turning points as we all have, but um, just before the, the football violence, probably about the same time, I started figuring out, hang on, I can fight. And I, and I, can, I could fight. My dad used to teach us boxing when we were young. His dad was a boxer, uh, my granddad. Um, and he's one of the top boxers in the country. And then the war came, of course, so he couldn't do it. So he used to do uh, prize fighting. And then he would sort people out in the local area. My granddad is a real tough bastard. Um, and we used to go down to Salford and see him and all of a sudden there'd be a knock on the door and, he'd, and, and Ted would have to go out, sort somebody out, come back, obviously make a few quid. Uh, so my dad taught us boxing when we was young and I didn't really like it. My 
brother was older and he and I think he bust my nose and you know it was it wasn't a very pleasant experience for me but uh, all of a sudden I, f I found I could hit people and it sounds weird that I look back on it now and and your life's your life right yeah and and I just figured out I could hit people and I could beat them and I enjoyed doing it and then I went to this pub probably within a month or a few weeks and uh, this bouncer in there was a right bully, a big guy. There's a few of them. And I'd done something. I was young and I was pissed. I maybe spilt something. And he came for me. And I thought, here we go. And I said, right, get outside now. I'm going to fuck you up. Why I said it, I have no idea, because I was shitting my pants. And... Uh, so this guy came out the pub of the whole pub. It's like a pub disco type thing. The whole pub emptied as well because they wanted to watch this young lad get battered by this guy. Anyway, uh, there's some like garages on a little bit of wasteland by this this pub. And and we, we started going for it and I was just banging him. I mean, really hard. I hurt both my wrists. I hit him that hard. And I remember it to this day. And he couldn't hit me. And I could just hit him. Anyway, I... I beat him down he's on his hands and knees crying he says don't hit me anymore right and I was like wow and everybody's like wow and then I saw this guy who used to bully me and I went you're fucking next boy and he went no Lee, Lee I don't want any trouble I don't want any trouble please and that was a big turning point for me for my confidence you know as a young man so then I got into the football um violence quite too much it was uh, How so? Uh, I think uh, living for the day, living for the fight, you know, because it was prearranged, some of it, some of it wasn't. And I just didn't care, just did not care. And and quite quickly, in the pecking order of football hooligans, as they called them then, uh, I, I started going to the top. And, uh, and then the local karate instructor from the same club, who lived across the the, the estate, uh, he had a chat with my dad. I remember my dad telling me, and he said, he said, Terry, my dad, he's dead now, God bless him. Uh, I, I held his hand when he died. The most empowering thing I've ever done in my life. I just felt so at ease. It's incredible, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And this man, I, you know, that uh, we all loved, he was a lovely guy. And, and it made me feel so at one with him. It's incredible that, isn't it? Yeah. And everyone else was crying and all that. And I thought, wow, no, this is great. I get to do this with my dad. Mad, isn't it? So the, the karate instructor said to my dad, you better get your boys. Because my older brother, he was into the football violence as well, but he wasn't as good as me. I was quite good at it, you know. <laughs> and so uh, he said, you better get them in the karate school before they, they end up in prison. And our local prison then was strange ways in Manchester, you know. And uh, I knew a couple of lads had, had been in, in there. And and again, even like today, if you go in prison for a stretch, your your social standing goes up in these circles, of course, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. So uh, I started... It's a badge of honour, don't It is, yeah, it is. And and it, that's how it is on, on uh, you know, some of these estates. So I went down to the karate school and it was a big fighting karate school. All they did was fight. They were well known all over the UK. And uh, I went down there and pretty soon I got really good at it in a very short period of time. So I think they had four fighting teams and the, the top team were all, all black belts, uh, some of them international players. So pretty soon within six months, I was on the team, on the A team. So when we used to go out to fight, there was four black belts and me, a white belt. And I used to go and win. And 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 when I got into the sport, it turned me away from the football violence and fighting in the pubs. You know, every, every Friday night, I couldn't go home without having a fight. Why do you think that's because of the discipline, that karate? Yeah, it is. It is the, it is the discipline, yeah. It's a discipline... And once you're in a combat sport, you get your, you get your, you, it fills you up. So you don't need to do it anywhere else. That's what I felt. I remember this one, this one time, there's this guy in the local area. I'll not say his name, but um, he was a real tough cookie. And something happened in the pub. And, I, and, uh, and he was just a violent, very violent guy. 
And uh, I said to him, look, I'm not going to fight you in here. If you want to fight, we'll go out and fight outside because I want to come back in and finish my pints. And he's like, hang on. So we go outside and, and he's rearing to go. And I said, right, just back off me a minute. Took my watch off took my shirt off, placed it down nice and neat. Bit of psychology going on here. And he said, what are you doing? I said, well, after me and you have fought, irrespective of who's won, I'm going to go with a nice clean shirt back in there and finish my pint. And he's looking at my light thinking, this guy's off his fucking head. And in the end he said, I don't want to fight. I don't want to fight you. I don't know why, but I don't want to fight you. So I said, are, are you done? And he said, yeah. I said, we're going to go back in the pub. You come near me, I'm going to, you know, we're going to, fight in the pub I don't want that I thought he was going to go in and blindside me or something anyway uh, a few days later he, he killed a guy with a shotgun this guy went to prison you know and all the rest of it so um, perhaps not the best guy to play this game with but it worked and then later when he came out of prison we kind of become friends you know so uh, yeah isn't that mad though that like you being bullied a lot of people have on the show being bullied end up turning gangsters SES, yeah, boxing, UFC, yeah, stems from bullying. Even that guy, his ego is probably so dented with you that yeah. he thought he's ever maybe needed to prove something towards somebody else. Mm, yeah, and I think you know, <coughs> James, in the cold light of day, and and this this has um, really served me well in in the in the work I've done in the clothes protection industry and in the military and things like that. That when you're really calm in an incident, and you know when people get violent, violence grows, doesn't it? And all the signs of violence in somebody that, you know, I'm trained to to see, that's how we, we can spot people in a crowd who are about to do something. It's the signs they're leaking. And as animals, which we are, we get that on a very, very deep level. So, you know, if you can overcome that and go into these situations not showing any signs whatsoever of anger, of anxiousness, of adrenaline. People don't get that. They're like, hang on. I'm doing this. You're supposed to do this. He's not doing it. I'm supposed to do this. He's supposed to do that. He's not doing it. And, and, and then in their brain, their subconscious starts going, hang on. There's something wrong here. This doesn't add up. And then they start questioning it. And then once they start questioning it, then you can bang them out if you want to. Yeah, because I had friends like that. <coughs> like if they were any sign of danger or people were taking them in the pub they used to get angry mm. loud aggressive and it was yeah. scary and people used to think fuck that they're yeah. off their head yeah but they couldn't fight no they could not fight and no. like you say if you're that camp then in your mind he's not reacting the way he should be reacting so it, it throws off whatever they're thinking yeah and balance and i had many friends like that and they were it's like acting it's like yeah. acting apart they're aggressive they're angry yeah. and they're thinking but you can't fight and but it used to 99 percent of the time it scared the people off it does yeah and when you get somebody like that <clears throat> and, they're, and they're showing these signs of anger and, and aggression and 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 they're um there's a book called the chimp paradox uh, professor steve peters yeah, I've read that. fantastic book he was my son's uh psychologist for for years on the on the olympic team and the, when he talks about the, uh, you know, the way your chimp works, your anger, you know, your fight or flight and all the rest mm. of it. Once you can control that and you pra you've got to practice it like mad. Once you can control it, you know, you get a person there who's, who's showing, you know, showing signs of aggression or whatever. This is the thing. I know exactly what they're going to do because it's telling me they haven't got a clue what I'm going to do. I have the power now. Even if I say, excuse me. I'm leaving and I walk away. I have the power. I take it from them. You know, it's mad, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And they, this, this will blow your mind, this, James, right? So we were in Tripoli uh, during the Second War and we had to take this really important person down to see one of the prime ministers. I think there was three then. And they were just knocking the shit out of each other. It was a horrible place to be. Lovely people, by the way, but a very, very dangerous, one of the most dangerous places in the world at the time. And we had to go into this, uh, this hotel so we had, a, I think we had about four or five armoured vehicles with us and I, I was a team leader. <clears throat> and uh, so I'm looking at this, every militia you could think of is in there, armed to the teeth. And there must have been maybe 200 militia men from different factions. And it was very tense. And, and we, we had to do it. It was mission critical for this organisation. This guy got in there to see him. And it was against every protocol that we would ever... But we had to do it. So 
we were outside and we we're about to deploy in as a team, a protection team. I said, right, I get on the air. I said, right, everybody take your weapons off. We're taking no weapons. And they're like, what? Are you fucking crazy? And I said, lads, if it kicks off in there, there'll be plenty of weapons lying around. We can pick them up. But, and, but I, I had a weapon. Uh, I took my, uh, my Glock in with me in, a, in a, like a really, I used to have this really fancy bag that looked, um, that you would see in London, patent leather and everything. It was ridiculously not a tactical bag or anything. And I used to dress quite smartly. So people kind of didn't know who I was, you know. Uh, but, but why I did it, James, was this. We had our operators, all great operators. I thought, if anything happened in there, they will pull that weapon. Because it's how we work as human beings, isn't it? I said, and if they pull that one weapon, it'd be like taking a water pistol to a gunfight because everybody else was so arm, heavily armed, you know. So I thought, if I can get my team th that don't have the option to pull the weapon, then they're not going to pull it. They'll find a different way to, to diffuse any kind of conflict, you know. And it worked really well. And then we were in there. And it's, have you ever seen that film, 13 Hours in Benghazi? No. Watch the film. If you want to see what Libya was like at the time, watch that film. You'll love it. Mm. And, and once you've watched it, give me a call. You'll call me straight yeah. away and you'll see what it was like. But there's a scene in there very similar to this. And, and what happened is they opened these gates and they let all these people in, you know, for, for publicity. But they could have been carrying or it was, it was just such a dangerous place. And we, get, we got out and I had to debrief my team after and I told them exactly why. And they kind of got it. You know, but that takes some balls to do that, man. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, um, growing up on the estate really, really served me well in, a, in a, you know, various ways. <clears throat> and then, what did I do then? I, I uh, what was see the adrenaline between the the hooligan stuff and the karate stuff? Is it totally night and day? Where did you get your bigger buzz? Um, I think. The karate and then kickboxing. Uh, because you're one of the highest ranked, aren't you? Eighth Dan, is that correct? Eighth Dan, yeah. Eighth Dan. Um, That's unbelievable. It is, it is. I, you know, I've spent a lot of my time. Uh, it's, it's my hobby, it's my passion, it's our family um, business. You know, we, we run karate schools, professional karate schools. We have a lot of instructors, we have great students. But I think with the karate and the kickboxing, because there's rules. And you have to, like any any martial art, any stand-up, any, any combat, there are rules. <clears throat> and the rules make it difficult to beat someone. And I think that gives you a bigger buzz because you've got to really train hard for it. So that's a massive buzz um, when you're stood in front of somebody and it's, it's you and them. It's very animalistic, isn't it? Mm -hmm. But I think this is what really helped me is that say for example i was stood across from a karate fighter or kickboxing or taekwondo i've done them all at international level i'd look at them in the eye one thing for sure is i trained harder than them and two is if i met you outside on the street i would fucking kill you and i knew it and they knew it too psychological isn't it yeah do you think know. that's where you are as well, a psychological, like a little, like a chess player, like you taking your clothes off, neat, hanging, like putting them yeah. neat, and it mentally fucks them? Like, where did you get that from? I think, I think I've always had it, you know. Tactically. I've always had it. I've always looked at, I looked after my brother in the pubs and that, you know. Mm -hmm. So I think it's in, it's in me to, to, to care, for, it might sound daft, to look after people. I've always had that gene in me. And, uh, and I think because I've studied it so much, I've studied the, the psychology of violence massively. And I now own it. I get it. I own it. I can, I can work with it. It doesn't intimidate me. It doesn't frighten me. You know, so, and how, I teach that. Yeah. How long did it take you to own it? Obviously, when you're bullied and then you start learning how to fight, now yeah. you start beating people up, yeah. start beating up your bulliers that... When did you learn to control that? Because obviously they've got the buzz for fights, they've had that drain, yeah. like they've had the power, something you've never really had as a kid. Yeah. When did you learn to control that and understand that you were a man who can kill, basically, a man who can take life? When did you learn how to control and walk away unless you were tested? Was that years and years of practice? Yeah, uh, yeah. I think I got it pretty quickly with the martial arts because this is the thing. Um, I wanted to be the best in the world 
that was my my aim, you know, when I was a young man. And uh, my instructor said to me, like, Lee, this is the score. If you get Nick doing this, you can't train. And that was a biggie for me then, because we used to have these crappy licenses you still do now. He says, I'll take that off you, and that's you done. And that was enough for me to say, right, I've got to stop this. And I sorted myself out almost overnight. Crazy, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And then I go into the pubs and stuff, and even in later life, going back to, to my local pub, which my nan and granddad used to run back in the day, and, and meet people and everybody go, oh, that's him. That's that guy. That, that, that's that tough guy, you know. And I didn't like that. And I still, and I don't like it. But but it just goes to show how your memory or the legacy lives on. And it wasn't a legacy that I, w I wanted as I got older. Crazy, isn't it? Yeah. But, um, but I think, yeah, it, it was the thought of losing my sport because I just wanted to be the best in the world, you know. Yeah. So what did you do when you started moving through the ranks then? Did you just stay focused into karate and kickboxing? Yeah, I, I focused on karate and I was moving up, uh, fighting some of the best people in the world and, and doing extremely well, you know. And then at 20, 21, I went to South Africa. So I just got on a flight, went to South Africa. I had, uh, I had a, a wife then, Melanie, and we had one child. And I went over, got myself a job, uh, got a place to stay, and then flew them over. And um, in South Africa, I went to this big karate school in jo Johannesburg. And um, there was, a, I went to this, this school, I think it was called Sch Schmutz, Jan, Jan Schmutz Academy, or something like that, I, don't, I can't remember. <clears throat> and it was massive, loads of black belts, maybe 30, 40 black belts, never seen this training in one club. And they were good. <coughs> anyway, I waited patiently. And this guy, the head instructor, he could see I was waiting. I didn't know who I was. And he came over and spoke to me and he said, uh, yeah, well, I think you'll find it different here. The the English are, are shit at karate. We're the best in the world. And he really gave me a dressing down. I'm like, you don't even know me. So I never went back. And I went to a taekwondo school and then karate and taekwondo, like bitter enemies, you know. <clears throat> and within six months, I was on the national taekwondo team. You know, I just love fighting. I just love it. It really uh, uh, gives me a sense of peace. Weird, eh? Quiet in your mind. <clears throat> yeah, definitely. Definitely. And life-threatening experiences are very similar, but a bit more intense. But it does quiet your mind. And, and going out to the pub on a Saturday night, the last thing you want to do is fight when you're doing it all week. So this is why, you know, we have hundreds of children training with us in our Sansa martial arts schools across the country. And I'm hoping and I'm praying that they find that in, in the karate as well, you know, and, and, and if it helps us create better human beings who can contribute to the community in a, in a nice way through the medium of sport, that's our job done. Yeah. So what did you do then? Married, kid? Were you just going to be involved in your karate, travel the world, fight around the world? Was, That's, yeah. Was that, what you'd... that was the plan. That was the plan. Then marriage and babies comes responsibility mm -hmm. and cash at the time. Cash was short. Not much money in karate or kickboxing as though. The, the, there is now. They didn't used to be, but mm -hmm. now a lot of people make a good living out of it. You know, our instructors make a good living out of it. Um, and and we, we specifically look for young martial artists who maybe have um, been injured or gone on their martial arts journey. And they're great athletes, great teachers, but they don't know the business side of things. And, and I didn't. And I remember going to a, a big business meeting in Wales for the karate, when I first opened my karate school here in 2000. Well, it's a kickboxing school then. Um, I went into kickboxing. I was quite successful at that, as well as my son, you know, he's world champion. And I went down to this meeting and there were, top martial arts school owners from all over the world. And I was asked to, to teach a high energy class, which I did. And then we went to the business meeting and they're all sat around talking about business. I hadn't got a fucking clue what they were talking about. And now I'm the little boy in the room now. And Kate was with me, uh, my wife, Kate, who comes from a really big business family. Her dad um, got the Queen's Award for Export. She knows all about business. 
And I came out of that meeting, I said to Kate, never again am I gonna look stupid like that. And I taught myself business. Studied it for years, so I became a master at it, uh, as much as I could be. Um, yeah, so the martial arts uh, now with these young kids, because of, uh, because of the internet and everything, we can centrally do all their marketing for them. We look after their students for them. We look after all the admin for them so they can just get up and teach. And that's what martial arts guys want to do. And, and I've, we've seen so many people up in martial arts schools who think, well, I'm going to earn a good living out of this. And they just fail. Because you've got to be a business person to run a business, haven't you? Yeah, so, keep it off the lot. Yeah. So now we're really lucky that we've got a great team. I've got 20-odd instructors on my team here. Um, and uh, we have great admin support and everything. So uh, we've just set a young lad up. He's just come off the British Taekwondo team uh, on the Olympic team. And for whatever reason, he had to leave. So we've we've set him up in Manchester and he's having a great time teaching. He loves it. Mm -hmm. so he's a real good success story for us you know yeah so if you're living a dream but a son over in south africa world champion karate kickboxing got your wife got your kid how did you end up involved in like military and close protection yeah it's interesting uh, my wife didn't like my wife then she didn't like south africa uh and she didn't really get it so i had to come back home so i came back home um a couple of years later and I didn't really have any, I had nothing. I was staying at uh, friends of mine, Stephen and Karen, God bless them, I love those people. And so we were staying there with a little baby. Uh, and then we had a second baby, uh, Janine. First one was Shemaine, and then Janine came along. And I, I didn't really know what to do. But I, I know I, I didn't want to go back to the steel factory. I was, um, I worked, I got an apprentice as a boilermaker, sheet metal worker, I worked in the steel factory for, you know, that's what I was doing in South Africa. And uh, I thought, right, I met a friend of mine in the pub and he was, uh, he joined the military police and I was chatting to him and he was telling me how good it was. And I thought, I just get that. There's me wanting to join a policing agency, having been a bad boy, you know, and I, I didn't have a lot of respect for the police um, because I didn't get what they did. And, and when you're in a community that everybody hates the police, then you go down that line, don't you? Mm -hmm. It's only, re you know, in later, you know, as I joined the police, I understood that, the, you know, what the police do and what a difficult job they have to do, not only with the public, but with the restraints that are on them and all the rest of it. So uh, I joined the military police. And I went down for my selection and, the, and the, the officer there did not want me to join the military police. He wanted me to join the engineers because I was, I was a tradesman. And I had a fit and I fought to get in and, and I joined the military police and I had 10 of the best years of my life. Incredible doing all, and I was so lucky that I did such a, a different range of things in the military police um, that just filled me up, you know. What's the difference, basis. military police, normal police? So the Royal Military Police is a, is an army unit and anybody listening to us who have been in the army, I bet they'll be going, oh, they'll have their comments on it. But the military police are the the army's police force. Yeah, the MPs have come, if people go AWOL and shit. Yeah, they do all, we do, they do all sorts of stuff. But, uh, but essentially, we don't have any powers to, to discipline anybody, really, what what would happen is the, the commanding officer of a, of a, a unit, it's an infantry unit, if any of their people did anything to contravene military law or whatever, you, you know, the military police guys would uh, arrest them and question them and, and make up a file on that one particular case and give it to the commanding officer and he deals with it. A lot of people think the military police deal with it, we don't. You know, that's what would happen. If you went to court martial, if it was a serious offence, murder or something really big, then it'd go to like a, a court martial, which is like a court, but without a jury as such. They're just officers that would sit on this and, and deal out the punishment, you know. You must have been hated more than a normal police store, like the military police. Because like, a lot of boys in the army, yeah. that, like they do go away well with the fuck off and in trouble. I but I wouldn't like to, I wouldn't like you coming at my door. Did you go to people's door who went to you all? Yes. Yeah. Oh, mate. Well, yeah. So I worked, I, I did so many different roles in the military police. Uh, I mean, I didn't wear a uniform for about three years, three and a half years. So um, the... The absentees and deserters, as we call them, um, generally the unit would have an absentees and deserters facility there and they'd pick them up. 
like you say, young lads, you know, um, people just had enough and they're desperate. So they pick them up and then they get processed either back into the military or into civilian life. So there's a procedure. Some of them went to prison, depending on what they've done. But um, I remember in Northern Ireland, I took over the absentees and deserters file there, which is like that thick, man. So I'm sat there thinking, why has no, nobody ever done anything with this? And they said, well, it's, it's too fucking dangerous. And I went, I'm going to do this. And I nailed a lot, mate. And it was so exciting. Uh, going into these really tough areas that we call terrorist areas where loyalist or... Uh, so, yeah. So either Protestant or Catholic. Catholic. And uh, I would go in and get these people out just to get the buzz. I did it for me. I didn't have to do it. It's the buzz that you get from doing that shit, man. So, um, yeah, I have done that, knocking on doors, and I've done all sorts of stuff, mate. How were you treated from loyalists or like Catholics or Protestants? Were you... An enemy for the IRA side, or were you just military police are just enemy for both? Yeah, I think the British Army, you, you're you're not well liked yeah, yeah, yeah. from the Catholic side of things, and then things then, you know, it, it was pretty tense when I was there, eighty nine, nineteen ninety one, and it was a dangerous place, one of the most dangerous places to serve. And I've spoken to a lot of uh, people who've served in Iraq and Afghanistan and places like this, and they still say that was the most scariest place depending on what they did what job they did but uh and then with the protestants um they were uh obviously pro military but at the real top end of the hardcore loyalists they were always thinking what are you doing what's going on here why you know so they, they were always looking for people trying to infiltrate them you know through our various special forces people so there was a bit of untrust at some level but uh and i remember once right this is, this is fucking mad so we're in this pub me and this this guy and uh he was kind of working a little bit undercover and i was doing some i was just wearing civilian clothes hair there a bit longer and all that kind of stuff and uh there was there was there was three of us so it was a real hardcore loyalist place in this real hardcore loyalist area. So we were just having a drink. And I go to the toilet and I come back and they're surrounded by a, a, a group of guys. And I look at them and they're shitting themselves. And I went back and they said to me, how are you doing, father? I was like, I'm all right. And I looked at my mates and they were, asking me weird questions. I said, right, can we just stop this a minute? I said to my mates, what the fuck have you said? <laughs> they said, I was just taking up the, the fatherhood in some, and, and it was my last night out. How ridiculous. Because we all had cover stories, you see. And I looked at the lads and I said, right, lads, this has got to stop. Uh, and they said, right, okay, boys, we know you're military. We know you're not normal, normal military. You've got two options here. You try and leave, we'll fucking kill you. If you stay... You don't buy a drink all night. We know you're all right. Stayed there till about three in the morning, got pissed. Uh, uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, crazy, eh? Yeah. Mad. What did you do then after the military stuff? So um, after the military, I uh, there's various reasons why I left, but uh, it just wasn't the right time for me. I was, I, was, I was due to go back to Northern Ireland to work for this special forces unit. And then I'd got... Um, I was going through a divorce, so I couldn't go back. I think they said you have to wait 12 months or 18 months, you know, because you, obviously going through a divorce and stuff, you, you know, you, you're obviously mentally unstable. Also, they thought I was, and I, I thought it was pretty cool. Um, so I left, and I was determined not to go into security. So I got a couple of jobs. I just couldn't hold them down. You, you know the story, don't you? I just yeah. couldn't hold it down. So then somebody... I think they gave me a call or something and said, look, Lee, on the Mohammed Al Fayed team, uh, it's a big protection team, uh, there's a guy called Paul Hanley Greaves who, who I'd met before in the military. He said he's head of security, he's looking for guys. So I, I gave him a call, went down to London, got the job. And How then, hard was that to get the job? For Obviously, it's a big family, but billion, it's a rough, must be worth over a, must be a billionaire, Al Fayed. Mm. But how was it? The, the interview for that job well it, it was quite it was it was Paul cut corners with me so what, what you had to do then is um, 
you had to go down and have this interview with, with the head of security. And then you had to do all these uh, tests uh, to make sure you were not got any diseases or anything like that. Everything was tested by the doctors, you know, so you weren't bringing, you know, because a lot of military people, because you've been all over the world, you, you know, you can be carrying stuff. So you had the medical stuff to do. And then uh, there's another interview and then you had to do a handwriting test. I forget the name of it. You know, when they, when you do the handwriting and somebody looks at it and tells if you're a psychopath or something like that, don't they? <laughs> Have you seen it? Yeah, yeah, I think you can draw a circle as well. If you draw a perfect circle, I think uh, you're a no, psychopath. Mate, I can draw circles, can Same. you? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, good company. Love it, yeah. yeah. So, um, <laughs> so I didn't do the handwriting test. Paul said, look, you don't need to do it. You can start next week. And uh, one of the lads, this is so funny. You took it, I think you took it away with you, did the test and then sent it in, you know. So uh, his handwriting was really bad. So he got his wife to do it. So when he came back in, he said, we were a bit concerned, you're pregnant, mate. Oh, <laughs> yeah, yes, yes. Yes. And his writing. wife was pregnant. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's mad, isn't it? So they can find out things about you with writing? With your handwriting. It's a, it's a dark art, isn't it? Yeah. That is mad. So, like I say, a massive family and... Who were you protecting then, the father or the son? So uh, you, you had the uh, you had the, the the head of the family, Mohammed Al Fayed, yeah. and his wife Henny, and they had their four kids: um, Camilla, Jasmine, Omar, and Kareem. Omar being the youngest, uh, who I was chatting to last week. Actually, we kept in touch. It's, it's, it's such a lovely story. This um, he got in touch with me. Uh, I'll, I'll get get back to that. He got in touch with me. Uh, I don't a year ago uh, and he said Lee I'd just like to thank you for you know you changed my life how nice is that yeah, you're only a young boy same age as, as, as Damon uh, so yeah so each member of the family had their de designated protection and so when I went there uh, I worked in London learning all the routes, all the secret passages and everything I needed to learn, you know, about the, the family. And then at that time, uh, I think you spent about three weeks um, in their main residence in in Mayfair and you never got to meet Mr. Fayed for the first two weeks. Now, the first time you'd meet him is you'd open the lift door and he'd just look at you and walk past. And this was the, the, the vet. He did, if he didn't like you, you'd gone. Then the next thing, maybe two days later, you were allowed to speak to him. So he's letting you into, because I mean, when, you, when you're working, I spent more time with that, their family than mine. So you, you know, you get to see everything. And, 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 and so, you know, you can you imagine letting somebody into your family that's gonna live with you? You know, it's, it's, it's a big, and, I, and I, I totally get it. So I worked in London for a little while and then I got moved down to their, their home in uh, Oxted. And then I, worked a lot with the boys and then I worked sometimes with the girls or with Mrs. Fired uh, and then I went on to his team so I looked after him then and that was like the, uh, the, the, the it was you got paid more money it was a bit more credibility you know it's great job I love the job and then I was team leader for a, a little while and uh, yeah just had the most amazing experience you could ever imagine <laughs> private jets everywhere, helicopters, boats, the whole shooting match. How many <clears throat> security was protecting that family? Well, I mean, uh, at uh, at different stages, we had different uh, numbers, but it was a considerable team. Um, consi it was a considerable setup at that time. Yeah. Um, at any at any one time on the books, maybe fifty. 50? On the books, yeah. And we all work, work, worked around in rotation. But this is the thing, James, what people don't understand. I know you've read the book about close protection operators. Um, say, for example, in Northern Ireland, if we went out as a, a close protection team or, you, you know, because I worked in witness protection f f for a little while, uh, you might have four guys on the ground. You might have 150, 200 people around you in support of that you know so on the bigger close protection teams you've got your 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 surveillance people your counter surveillance uh your drivers you've got your close protection team that work with 
with the the, the VIP as such, and uh, and then you've got people around them. You know, so it's there's layers of security, and then you've got people at the residences looking after them, so nobody gets in there and and leaves things in there, cameras, bugs, um, whatever. So it, every everywhere you go, you're trying to make it as sterile as possible because there was massive threats against uh, the family and him. He brought down the government with the cash for questions carry on, which I was, I was involved with. Um, so yeah, what was that? And so. Um, what he did is he wanted his British passport, but they wouldn't give it, him the passport because when he bought Harrods, there was a big legal case that went on with him and this guy called Tiny Rollins who tried to buy it. And what they, what they were alleging is he bought it with somebody else's money. And it was the um, one of the uh, Sultan of Amman who he used to work with. So I think he had his gold credit card and bought it but the, the sultan went there and said no 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 there's nothing going wrong here his money's my money i'm okay with this this is fine so i think at the end of that trial he, he was found not guilty but i think the upper classes put like the death wish on him and said but it wasn't he didn't do it like a gentleman so he couldn't get his british passport how crazy is that everything he used to do here he was a very generous man you know he did a lot for charity um but which, which he never told anybody for children's hospitals and things like this and for the older people in his town at hampers at Christmas and everything but he never publicised it and you're thinking we need people like that in our country and I just don't get it you know in the UK so um, yeah so what happened was he went to prominent politicians and said look can you ask these questions in, in the House of Parliament about my passport and there's some money go and stay at my ritz hotel free so he that's what he did and in the end they weren't asking the questions so he says right okay i'm going to show you fuckers and he said right publicly that person that person that person i've done this 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 and there's the evidence and he brought the government down that's mad isn't it so they took money expecting them not to just walk away no, yeah. but, but he's not that kind but of guy. He's, he's always had a target on him for some reason. Even me in the news, newspapers always been negative about the man. How was he as an individual? He was one of the most intelligent men I've ever seen. There's him and this. People are going to freak at this. Alex Salmond. I worked with Alex during the referendum. What an incredibly intelligent guy he is, irrespective of his policies and 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 what he believes. Just him as a as a human being, hyper intelligent, incredible. But Fayed was the same. His attention to detail, I've never seen anything. I've learned so much with him about attention to detail and stuff like that. And we, we walked through Harrods, you know, the size of it. And we'd, we'd, we, every day we'd walk the floor with him, maybe sometimes for an hour, sometimes for 10 minutes, but he'd always walk around his store, around the shop. And, you know, he'd be walking past something and he'd be like, stop, get me the manager. And they would, they would shit themselves. Out they come, and he'd, go, and he'd go, look at that stand over there. And I remember one, it was with umbrellas. One was upside down. I'm thinking, how did you see that? In this massive store with everything going on in your life, with all your businesses, or you find a bit of dust somewhere. Mad, eh? He had all that, billionaire, and he was so invested into that store. It meant so much to him. It's incredible, eh? How many hours a day did you used to have to work when you'd done close protection? How many hours a day? Um, because we're all ex-military, uh, we're generally in the, in the close protection industry in the, in the area I work in. It's a lot of ninety nine point nine percent ex-military, so you're used to working long hours. So you don't clock off, and it's given, you know. So if I if I uh, was to go on um, on operation, you would stay till it's finished. I mean, the, the the worst I've done, I think it's three days, I was standing up asleep because <laughs> we were just knackered. We had a few hours sleep in three days. It was, it was hideous. Uh, and you, you, you just, no matter how tough you are, no matter how trained you are, there's a breaking point, isn't there, when you, when you sleep deprivation. And I remember on this one job, and, and the Queen came over to Northern Ireland and uh, she had her protection with her and we were... The, the the next ring of protection looking after her 
and I was absolutely hanging. And at the end of it, I was doing top cover in the in the Land Rovers. You, know, you stood at the top of the, the vehicles that we had then uh, with the weapons. You see them in the war zones, don't you? So I was doing top cover and I was I fell asleep in that position. There's nothing you could do. We were banging helmets. We were absolutely knackered. So you operationally, you're not fit for purpose, you know, but but generally, you know, in it, with the fire team and other jobs I've done, sometimes you can put in an 18-hour day because what you've got to do is, this, this is the thing a lot of people don't understand. So you've got to do your physical training yourself to keep you, you know, keep on top of your game. So you've got to be mentally fit and physically fit. So say, for example, you knew the family were, were doing something, and let's say nine o'clock. So you'd be ready for eight, for example. And then you, you've got to prep everything. So that might be another hour. Then you've got to do your fizz, which would be another hour. Then you've got to shower, change, all of a sudden. So now you're getting up at five o'clock. And so they go out and do their own thing. Then say, for example, you go back to the residence or wherever you are on a yacht or something, they'll go and have a sleep. Now you've got work to do then, prepping for what you're doing that evening. And then they've, they, they might be out in the nightclub till two, three in the morning, repeat. Mm -hmm. See, repeat. see when they're on yachts and stuff like the food I'd imagine the chefs and that they're all every background checks with everybody with the food obviously because you see the Russians and people are getting poisoned yeah, this and that was, yeah, yeah. was that always a qu question marks for himself like eating the right foods and the waters and everything was that all tested well it, it's was that it, a bit extreme no 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 not at all it, it, it is a concern but what we had with the chefs and they'd been with the family for that many years they were known to us, you know, and and a lot of his staff stayed with him for a long time. He used to pay the best wages, they expect the best, and that's what he got. So um, new people were vetted, of course, and uh, and then let into the fold slowly. So they might maybe work at Harrods for a couple of years, three years. So then you get to know them, then they may, might come in and do something on a low level. And then once they're accepted by the family, they're trusted. And that's that's pretty standard, standard yeah. stuff, you know. Was there ever any attempts of his life when you were working there? Um, were there any attempts? Um, how can I say? When you have a, a protection team as professional as that one, the the people who are watching you, and we did find people watching us, doing surveillance on us uh, from um, MI5, which was standard, uh, and others, what you're hoping is they're going to look at your le level of security and they're going to go, no, nah, we can't get away with this. It's too much. And then put them onto somebody else. You know, it's, it's, this, is, this, is, this is an interesting thing. I've always thought this. So say, for example, in Glasgow, let's say on a Saturday night in Glasgow, there are, I'm going to make this up, 400 attacks against some, the person in Glasgow. Let's say, for example, there's 500 happen on a Saturday night. You can't change that. That will always happen but you can make sure it's not you by taking precautions. So the people who didn't like him, and he had a lot of people who didn't like him, you, you, what you're doing when you're doing your close protection stuff is you're look, watching them watching you. And, and an attack starts, the, the, the principles of an attack are the same or very, very similar. So the first thing is going to happen is somebody's going to watch you. They've got to look at you. They've got to assess you. Sometimes it can be over a period of years. Sometimes it can be a minute. You're in a pub, somebody looks at you and you know something's going to kick off or in a kebab shop or wherever. So there's, they're identifying victims. And these people who are, you know, just out for fighting or just that kind of violence, they're assessing all the time, yes, no, no, yes. And they're picking out the victims and then they'll go for one. And if you miss the stage where you've been victim selected, you're one rung up the ladder. Does that make sense? Yeah. Now, if you don't know it's happening, the next thing that's going to happen is they're going to approach you. They've got to approach you to, to interact with you, okay? Now, if you... So if you're at that stage, you see the approach, you can defuse it at that stage. If you miss the approach, now the next thing that's going to happen 
is there's going to be some kind of distraction generally, maybe verbal or, or something. Something's going to happen and then comes the violence after that. Now, most people react to it when the violence is about to start. So say, for example, you're teaching self-defense. You grab me here, I grab you there. You hit me, I do this. That's, that's bullshit. It's too late. So 99% of avoiding trouble as a close protection team is done before the person even get, gets there. Mm -hmm. And if you, get, if you get that right, then you avoid attacks. So say, for example, out in Libya was a, a really good example. Our team, uh, I've worked in several teams there, all, all Brits, very professional, great guys. And then you see some other countries doing their, or the United Nations or NATO, and you look at their close protection teams, and we would look at them and go, shit, they're going to get hit. And they did often get hit because the drills weren't good enough. They were real gung-ho. It's all about me, the bodyguard, look at me. And no one's watching what they're supposed to be doing. But when the, when the terrorists or the criminality look at this, that's what they're looking for because they want to get away with it. They don't want a hard target. They want something they know we could do this and we can win. Same, same as um, street violence. You know, you're never going to pick on the hardest bastard that you think is going to kill you, you know, unless you're high on drugs or something. So the, the, if, you, if you harden yourself as an individual or as a close protection team and you make it really hard for the terrorists to even go, nah, forget that one, we'll go for this one and just push him onto another team. Yeah. Crazy, isn't it? Yeah. How was it? Were you in speaking terms a lot with Al-Fayed or was it just a case of do your job and go to bed? Yeah, yeah. Um, with the Fayed family, uh, great relationship with the kids. Um, used to chat to his wife quite a lot. She hated security. Hated security. Oh. I think it just interfered with her life. Yeah, not private. No. And, and her and her eldest daughter, they were they were really good at escaping from the from the security. And uh, they'd go into shops, put a different jacket on, climb, try and climb out the window. Not his, his, his wife wouldn't tr try and climb out the window, but she'd try and ditch security. And I remember um, I got put on t to look after Jasmine, his eldest daughter, a lovely, lovely girl. And she used to run the guys around like crazy. And if you lost her, you'd get sacked. As you would, wouldn't you? If you put somebody in charge of somebody you love and they lost them, then you'd just get rid of them. And that's what you'd do. So I said to Jasmine, I said, look, Jasmine, this is the score. I love my job. I like working for the family. But if you're going to try and hide from me or get away from me, it's not going to work. I'll go home and I'll resign now. But if you and I can come to this arrangement that you're not going to do that to me, I'll cut you a bit more slack. I'll give you a bit more freedom, but you've got to be honest with me. And she went, yeah, okay, I'll do that. Is that all they wanted? Just a wee bit of freedom, maybe hang out with their friends, I'd go for ice cream without the... I think Somebody so. watching over your shoulder. I think so, yeah. But uh, a lot of the bodyguards, and no, I'm not saying a lot, I mean, it could be a lot, yeah. The frying to speak to the, the clients, as we call it, um, or the person you're looking after, because it's, oh, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. You know, they're really formal. Well, Robots. Yeah. And I get it, but a lot of them, they just want you to be like, we're chatting now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, I'm very professional. I do my job, as you know, but we're going to talk like human beings. I'm not subservient to you. Although, you know, you call them mom or sir, whatever they want to be called. But, you know, you've just got to see through all the bullshit, man. It's yeah. crazy, isn't it? I know on one um, operation I was on in Libya, working work for this big uh, NGO, it was so dangerous. We were one of the last ones out uh, during the Second War. All the embassies left, and we were, uh, I think it was Brussels or Geneva was headquarters, and they wouldn't let us go <clears throat> with this one um, team of people I was working with. There was about 50 of them, and I was running the close protection team. We had about 35, 40 people in the protection team and it got to the stage where it was that dangerous and, and we had swimming pools in this compound we're in and uh, we had the security set up there and then we had their set up and we got some direct fire AK and stuff into the compound but uh, the, the rockets that was landing and the mortars and that the swimming pool would shake and there's loads of peacocks in this place. And the peacocks, have you heard them when they go off? They're loud, man. Mm -hmm. Hundreds of them. 
when one came close, all the peacocks would start um, making the noise they make and all the pools were shaking. So we're in this situation, right? And we can't get out. No boats. Airport's been, uh, the, the Battle of Tripoli Airport, they smashed it to pieces. I was in that. That was fucking horrendous. So we're trying to get out. Um, so uh, we went and tried to buy a boat and I knew we were gonna get we were gonna get ripped off. This is during the war this, so I took some some guys down there, we, we tried to buy this boat, and I knew we were gonna get uh well, you know, your set your spider senses start tingling. I th I thought they were gonna just shoot us and, and take the money. So we bugged out of this place. It was like a big disused building. And that was that was a bit tense. So we go back and this one guy, he was French, and he was a reporter, a journalist. So he came up with this plan to go to um, Al-Qaeda. We, Al we had ISIS pushing through, we had Al-Qaeda there, and uh, we had the, the militias kicking the shit out of each other. So every, it was a free for all. So he said, look, we'll go to Al-Qaeda, make a deal with them. I can do this, this is what he's saying. And, um, and they'll look after us. This was the plan. He was a wannabe. He wanted to be like us. You know, the, the close protection guys, he'd ask for a weapon and stuff, you know, and we would never let him. He'd run around the around the camp like we used to do with a big Bergen on, a big back. But it was empty. We knew, you could tell it's empty. You know, he's just crazy. He's, he's just some kind of wannabe flipping James Bond guy. So they went for this plan that they were going to do this. And, and they asked me, would I take my team in? So it's, this plan's been okayed, and they said, "Rightly, come up and brief us." So, w when you did any big operations there, you briefed, you know, the the head guy and all these people. It was a big setup, and uh, everyone put the ten penneth in, and uh, the head of the commission sat there, and and my direct boss, he says, "This is going to happen," uh, despite me saying, "This is fucking suicide. We're going to die." So they're all going to do it, and he said, "Right, Lee." tell me what your take on this operation is. And I stood up and I said, right, this is my take on this operation. This is fucking insane. This is going to get everybody killed and I'm not sending my men in there. And everyone's like, shit, I don't believe you just said that. And he said, Lee, that's the most sensible thing I've heard all day. Everybody get out. And we had a chat, me and him. Mm. How so, did it go? It, it went really well and we didn't do the, the that operation you know but um it, it just sometimes having a somebody somebody will say put it down to oh you've got a big gob you you know, you know that saying mm -hmm. or you've got a loud mouth it's not i'm just i'm just trying to be sensible when in utter chaos you know so yeah. and that's generally you know i generally get on with a lot of people but mm -hmm. sometimes you've just got to say it as it is haven't you how was your relationship with dodie so dodie <laughs> dodie was uh uh, it was a quiet guy and he would be around the family quite a lot and, you know, driving sometimes and he wasn't a very chatty guy, but he would talk to you, you know, he's, and cause he, uh, he did a lot of films and so he did Chariots of Fire, executive producer for that. So he had his busy social circle going on, you know, a young man, you know, going around all the bars and nightclubs and all the rest of it. And then he had his business that he did. So I think he was uh, a very thoughtful guy. So sometimes, you know, he's on, he's on his phone a lot. So really, you know, he wouldn't speak sometimes on a car journey. He'd just say hello or whatever. So, um, yeah. And again, when you get a person who's a little bit introverted like that, you just give them their own space, don't you? Mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't want to speak to him, but if he wanted to speak to me, I'd speak, you know. Yeah. So obviously you've got your team then, it's a pretty good job. You're loving it, paid well. When did you find out who's with Princess Diana? So um, I'd been out to Saint Tropez that year before for a couple of weeks with the family. And then when I came back, so generally we'd work two or three weeks on, two or three weeks off. So we'd only worked six months of the year on that job. And um, it, it did sometimes, you know, seven months maybe. Um, so I knew she was coming out before I went on Back, back to Saint Tropez. Is that before it was in the press or the news or anything? Yeah, yeah. So we knew she was, but she'd been seeing Dodi. You know the the various teams we had in all the various locations. We'd get fed back all the intelligence would come back to us. So so when you went on uh, to work, we we had a book 
that was everything was recorded in. So when you went in to work, you get the book and you just read through it, see where everybody was in the world, what they were doing, where the family were. Because, you know, these, these families like the Fireds, I could go into work on a, a, a say, a Monday morning. There might be no family there, you know. I, I've gone to the airport with my kit for the Balearic Islands and I've ended up in Gestat with <laughs> your hats and your shorts and all the rest of it. So you wouldn't even know where you were going to go uh, sometimes, you know. But the Fired family was so generous, you know, they buy you all new clothes and, you know, whatever you needed. Very, very generous guy. So uh, so you, you go in, find out where all the family were, and, and then obviously there was intelligence coming back from our teams that Dodie and the princess, so we knew they were seeing each other, but I wasn't interested. I'd had other things to do, you know, because there's a lot of pressure when you do that job. You've got to be on the ball. Um, so when we knew she was going to Saint Tropez, it wasn't a shock to us. How was that then, that protecting our family and then the most famous woman on the planet getting involved who then never had any security because when she was left the royal family, it took her security away. So did you just have to enhance security even more or just be more aware yeah we enhanced security for that trip and uh the princess came out with the with the boys harry and william and they had a policeman each from the royal protection that came with them two great guys and because it was that busy with the paparazzi you have never seen anything like it in your life and because it was such a fast moving environment. Sometimes the, the policeman would be going out with Mr. Fired or they could be going out with the, the kids. So we all just mixed in as one team, uh, which was really cool for the, these guys. And, and the policeman said, you know, what a professional outfit we were, you know. So, uh, and they've been working in close protection for a while. And on the Fired team, we had some of the top close protection people in the world, you know, ex SAS, ex military police close protection lads, you know, so we had some great experience there, mm -hmm. you know, and then we had uh, ex MI5 people working for us and all sorts of stuff. So it was a great team. What was the first conversation you had with Diana? Yeah, the first conversation I had with her, uh, she was getting off the tender, the boat, the small boat that came from the, from the, the super yacht. Uh, one of the super yachts and she comes in and the paparazzi didn't know we were there then this is day one so uh, I just leant over and gave him my shoulder because to, to, you don't want to put your hand out some people don't like touching you you know the high net worth individuals they don't even like touching you you know so I just put my shoulder down to uh, for her to lean on if she needed to she didn't she just jumped straight out like a flipping like a flipping doing but uh she's a fit fit lady and she said oh what more heavies and smiled at me and laughed and i introduced myself and uh, that's the first conversation i had so she, when she said more heavies she meant obviously more protection mm -hmm. you know so how was it you know as a whole there was going on once the media and that started finding out where they were that did that sort of give a lot of unrest as well especially with cameras could potentially be guns behind that are people trying to attack that was yeah. that always a concern yeah yeah it's <clears throat> you know uh, the princess then she was the most well-known person in the world you know without a shadow of a doubt and she was doing all the the demining stuff she wanted to stop them doing landmines so there's there, there was people that she was obviously upset in there so and, and and various things and high net worth people stalkers she had a lot of stalkers and stuff like that that uh, we knew about we had pictures of them and things like this so with the paparazzi they were so aggressive uh i think day two they started and then there was two of them uh, and because we wouldn't let them in into where they wanted to go on on the beach because the beach is in france they're not private so they wanted to go on the beach, or well, we wouldn't let them. And um, they, I think we upset them a little bit. One of my friends banged one out, because uh, they had protection with them as well, some of them. He had a protection. Why? There. Because they're so aggressive in what they're doing, they they know that people can get aggressive with the the cameraman. So they call it backwatch. So they had, some of them had their own protection. So a friend of mine, he banged out the, the protection guy, and we we sent them on the way and they said right we're going to tell everybody now and they did and there were hundreds and hundreds of them just you know it was just insane at one stage i, I was looking 
and they must have been to, to our left, maybe a hundred to our right, maybe the same. They must have been fifty bolts just off the the beach, this small small beach, the fire the fired beach, and uh, there was even a helicopter went over. Because I think that then some of the iconic pictures you see of the princess, there was one of me and her in a boat where she's whispering to me, that made it all over the world. Some of them sold for a million euros. So you can see why why they were so aggressive to get in and get in your face and try and take a compromising uh, photo but or airbrush it, which they did then. I don't know if they still do it now. You never know. Yeah. I would hazard a guess. But there's a famous one of her saying she's pregnant uh, in this like a leopard type print uh, and we looked at it and we're going that's not her they they, they altered the photograph and then made the story up yeah frontline news diana's pregnant it's going to sell all around the world yeah gonna make them a lot of money yeah because but see when she's like does she have any agreement with the press to say like take photos there and then try and leave me alone or was it just yeah. a case that she had to surrender to what was around her <coughs> yeah she did and we would speak to the princess in the morning she'd come down in the morning and, and i would chat to her on the beach that was her like routine and she said look this is what what i'm going to do this is this works she said i'll pose for photographs from we'll tell them they can get the photograph i can manage it they'll get the photograph and then they'll go and their sort of like mo would be once they got the photograph, they'd go into Saint-Tropez and they'd all get pissed. And then they'd turn up later in the morning. That's that's what they did. So she was, some of the pictures you've seen of her sat, sat on various things and just like reclining in the in the sunshine. They'd take the photographs and be like, look at her lapping it up. She loves all this, posing for the camera. Bastards, eh? Yeah. And, and, and she only did it so that they'd go and the children could go and play in the sea. So she couldn't do right for doing wrong. Can you imagine living in that life? Yeah, and she was a phenomenal woman, like you said. It was at the Halo Trust. She yes. changed with the landmines, like she'd walking down the, the street with landmines to to change it. Then she was yeah. going seeing the kids with AIDS. And, yeah, I know. But like, like, like you say, a lot of these high end people they don't even touch you. No. Don't even like to stand close to you. No. Like, we're peasants. Yeah, to yeah. The high end people. You're breathing my air. Yeah, go away. Yeah. But yeah. like, was she just such a kind? So as she. As a lot of people say that, like you say, the most famous women on the planet yeah. probably to this day. Yeah. Like, was she as kind as she was when you've seen a lot yes. on TV? Yeah, she was. You know, she, she'd speak to the to the chefs, the cleaners. She sent me a lovely letter after it, Sam, you know, that she wrote with her son's signatures on, thanking me for looking after her. And imagine how busy she was taking time to do that. That's amazing, isn't it? And when you met her, she she was a special person. You know, when you meet somebody with that charisma, with that with that vibe, you know, and, and uh, she was. And and this is, we didn't have social media or anything then, of course. And and the question is, why did everybody love her? Because people could see what she was like, and the media, especially the media in the UK, the tabloids then, uh, just destroyed her. I just find it hard to believe that they could have wrote so many good things about her, but chose not to. Bad news sells in the UK, right? Yeah. Did she ever read the articles herself? Um, I think she did, yeah. There was there was, uh, there was, there was one uh, with with a picture of her. I think it was the Sun newspaper or, or one of them. There was a picture of her and a picture of Camilla. So it was a beautiful picture of her and an awful picture of Camilla. How can you do that to people? And I think it said... Uh, Charles chooses her over her, that that kind of thing. It was headlines, front, front page news. I saw it in the, the, the newspaper that morning and I was like, oh my God, what a bad position to put Camilla in and Prince Charles and the princess and they've got kids. Why would you do that? Sells papers, right? So I said to the princess, I said, have you seen the daily papers today? Because I wanted to just give her the heads up of, as to what was in. And she said, are you, are you meaning that article in that paper? And I said, yeah. Like, are you okay with it? And she said, well, it's his choice. I just changed the conversation. And great. That says a lot about a person, that, doesn't it? And, you know, and seeing her play with her boys, what a great mother she was. 
delighting in playing with the boys. You could hear her hooting and hollering, and you know, and she was a lovely, lovely woman. Yeah. Do you not get your buzz felt though? Because did they not go dancing, Princess Diana and yeah. Dodie? And you were kind of making a, a dig at yeah, dancing. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> you know, when someone comes out your mouth and you go, "You dick! Why did you say that?" And 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 she was known for dancing. She was a good dancer, and she she danced with some of the top professional dancers. And you know she obviously liked dancing. Dodie, on the other hand, wasn't as gifted. He was gifted in many things, but dancing was perhaps something he needed to pay a bit more attention to. So I just made a a, a, a glib comment, say uh, something like, I can't remember now. You know, what do you think about Dodie's dancing or something like that? And she said, Lee, I remember this. I didn't even understand what the word meant at the time. She said, Lee, don't make me terse with you. That was it. And looked me right in the eye, and I knew. Shut the fuck up, Lee. Take it too far. But it's too far. Like that. You know, when someone comes out and you're thinking, because I, I, would, I, I would chat to her every day, you see. So, uh, yeah, I apologised and uh, yeah, give myself a slap. Yeah, because did I leave? What, what year was this? 97. So that was the same year she passed? She passed a few weeks after that, yeah. So, because she wrote a letter to, is it Paul Burroughs in 96? And yeah. says that they were going to kill her yeah. in a car accident. Yeah. Was there, she ever in fear of her life? Did you ever feel that Yeah, vibe? she was. Yeah, I spoke to Paul Burrell actually in London the other day and he was telling me about that same letter. And he's got, you know, his own things. I, I don't really read the news or I don't follow media or anything like that. So, you know, I don't follow the Princess Diana stuff. But um, yeah, her friend Gianni Versace was killed. And everybody thought it was a, a planned hit. That you know, it, looking at what happened in the security industry, that's what everybody thought had happened. It was a classic uh, hit, but it turned out it was something slightly different. But um, I bumped into her on the top deck of the boat. I was going to look for the security cabin. We we had an allocated security cabin on this massive boat, so that we could get changed and just hang out. You know, if we went on the boat, and they changed the security cabin, and I was trying to find it. And I was on this big open deck, you know, just all glass. And there's only, I walked in there and I'm almost like as close as I am to you, to the princess, with her back to me, looking out over the uh, over the harbour. And she turned around, she'd obviously been crying and a lot. And uh, she said, have you heard about my, my friend? Um, and I said, yes, yeah, we have, you know, it's awful what's happened, you know. And, you know, I know you knew him and I'm really sorry. And, and she was crying and she said, uh, do you think they're going to do that to me? Do you think, do you think, and I, I kind of like say, no, and look at your team, you know, we'll, we'll protect you. Trying to calm her down. And as she steps closer, anybody else, you just give them a hug, right? I think that's what she wanted to feel that. But can you imagine if I'd have done that, the paparazzi got a snap of that. That would have been awful, wouldn't it? So, all your human instincts wants to comfort somebody, but you can't. You've got to step back. And I had to step back and said, look, I've got to go now. I'm really sorry. If you need anything, just you know, give me a call. And just walked out and shut the door. Mm -hmm. See letters like that with her saying that she was fearful of her brakes getting cut and they were going to kill her next. That. Yeah. Do you get briefed on that as well? Or is that just something you hear through the media? Well, at that time... Uh, we were we were aware of it. So you do your background when you, when you work with somebody, you always do your background um, checks on them, and and you do a you profile them. So you would profile the person and and look for anything like that. So you, just so you understand where what where they are coming from and what mindset they're in, because if you're working with a client who is fearful of their life, they're going to be more happy to work with you on your recommendations. If you if you go and protect somebody who doesn't see the need for it, they're not going to want it. So it helps you pitch where your level of security will be. But also it helps you understand their mindset, what they're thinking. But also it helps you understand of what things they've encountered and what threats they feel are against them. And then you've got to try and work it all out and do a, a risk assessment on that, you know. Mm -hmm. Were they happy together with the kids, Harry and William? Like, was it, could they enjoy it as a family? Yeah. Or was it so difficult because you've got security, you've got paparazzi, like, yeah. you've got all the negative press. Yeah. Like, could they enjoy being a family? Yeah, they could, yeah. And 
with the fire security, because we were all, you know, we'd worked for the family for a while, so you change your stance. So say, for example, we're operating in London, you'd be in a suit and a tie and all the rest of it. If we went on holiday, you know, say to, I don't know, New York or, or wherever, so now you've got to blend in. So your security posture goes lower. It's still there, but nobody would know you're a security team. So you're almost like a surveillance security team. Uh, and and you're watching them and you're close, but you, you're dressing up to blend in. And, and you know, when you do it right, and I've, I've done this loads of times and, you, and you're in a, a situation where it could be at a, at a meal, it could be at a meeting and people come up to you and say, uh, and what do you do here? You know, are you, are you a CEO of a company or something like that? Now you, you've got it right then because you don't know that you're security, you don't stand out, which is which gives you an advantage, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. So who was Prince William and, and Harry? How were they both as kids? Great kids. Yeah. Yeah. Harry, naughty little boy, mischievous boy, reminds me a lot of my son, uh, Damon, when he was little. Uh, and... Uh, William was like a thoughtful, more thoughtful boy, but we would sit for hours chatting with them on the boat when we were, we, we, we tried to sail off to various beaches that we knew the paps couldn't follow us. Uh, and they would eventually catch us, but you know, the boat would go out we'd, and we'd say, we've got an hour and a half here before they come and then we'd move. So the boys would sit with all the security guys and chat to us because they were fascinated by the military at that young age. And they were, everyone was telling them stories and they were telling us stories about stuff they'd done at school, which I would never repeat because some of them are quite, quite funny. But uh, yeah, so we were just chatting like we were chatting. Like you would chat with kids, mm -hmm. you know, and I get on with kids. Yeah. You know, because I've, I've got six kids, so I love kids. So at the end of the holiday, this is the last time you see Princess Diana. Did you ever have a feeling that, did you ever worry for her life when she was leaving? Or was it just good vibes i had a good hold and it was just i'll see you soon yeah it was, it was uh yeah it was good vibes it was uh because you know at that time um we were the, the security team we were uh bolstering up the team in america when Dory went to america where where he lived in uh, you know in the los angeles area he used an american security team so one of our lads went over and we thought, mm, hang on, why, why is somebody going over then? And then they said, the head of security said, right, I want some volunteers. You know, I think it was four people, five people, I can't remember now. I put my name down because I wanted to go, you know, I've got a lot of family in the States. So, um, so we knew before then that something was happening. Then when the princess told me she was going to live there, it, it kind of made sense, you know, why Mr. Fayed wanted a big security presence there so obviously possibly double up with, with and look after the princess you know yeah so both of them are going to live in america yeah and you were to go and protect them as well yeah now um apparently uh the house she looked at was julie andrew's old house so although they weren't going to live in the same house or in the same area so it just made sense and, and it just looked like a, a young love affair to us to me you know, when you see somebody for the first time just getting to know each other, I didn't think anything would, you know, now everybody's got their own opinion on it, of it, of course. But for me, yeah, and, I, and I generally um, say it as it is, they were just a, a young couple. Uh, he was obviously um, smitten by her, I would say. And for the first time in years, Dodie was like a different guy, smiling, happy. I thought, yeah, good on you. Good on you, mate. Yeah. Yeah. So after that then, like 19, 31st August, I think, 1997, was that when they were in the Ritz? Yes. Before they jumped in the car? Yeah, yeah. Were you not there that night? No, no. So um, when we left that 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 one stint in, in Saint-Tropez, we knew Trevor Reese jones who was Dodie's bodyguard, he was going with Dodie and the princess on, on a med cruise and another person had to go with them. Dodie, well, generally they just have one person with him because he was quite under the radar, Dodie. Dodie. Uh, so nobody wanted to go because we were hanging, man. I was tired. I think I slept for about two days after that one. Uh, so we drew straws 
as to who would go. There was about five of us drawing straws, and the, and one of the lads was on the boat. We'd, we'd isolated him there because he had the flu, so he didn't give it anyone. So one of the lads, uh, he drew his next uh, SAS lad, he drew the, the short straw, and he went, I guess that's Kez's then. And his name was Kez, the guy who had the flu. So he said, right, it's Kez that goes then. So we told him, he was pissed off. He didn't know what we'd done, but we said, yeah, you drew the short straw, mate. So I, I was thankful because I, I didn't want to go. I was absolutely hanging, mm -hmm. tired, you know. We had a busy summer, you yeah. know, a month of just really working hard. Because probably one of the most, it's like the biggest death probably ever on the planet because there's so much speculation, so many conspiracy theories, yeah, yeah. blood getting tampered with, like, why wasn't there security behind the car? I think the driver as well, Henri Paul, is it? Yeah. But he worked with MI6 as well, is that? There's so many things, you know, and and I, I I can only comment on what what I what I saw and what I heard, but all these conspiracy theories, I think, because there's so many holes in it, and you know, so many th things that went wrong. You know, that car that went in, they've never found a car, and there was motorbikes that went in that they, you know, the, the security cameras are off. It just leads for people to go, well, why? Why did that happen? Why did the, the what, what's the problem with the blood? When they first searched his flat, they found two bottles of booze. Then when they searched it again a few days later, they enough to stock a bar. Why did they miss it? Or did they, and I think, I think actually, I was reading through the coroner's inquest. I gave evidence down there. And I think the policeman who was in control of the search said, yeah, I agree. It could have been put there after the first search. So even those small things are enough for people to just grab hold of them and go, right, well, if that's wrong, what about this? And they start looking then, don't they? But mm. I don't think we're ever going to know what happened in that tunnel. Uh, I do say in the book, I believe uh, the, the intelligence services were there. And why would they not be looking at, you know, watching what was happening? I would be surprised if they weren't. You might, can you imagine? Right. Imagine this. So you're the head of the intelligence services, let's say in the UK, for example, and we're at a bit of a meeting and you say to your, your heads of your department, right, so where's uh, where's Princess Diana now, the, the mother of the heir to the throne? And they go, I haven't got a clue. It's not going to happen, is it? You know, it's... So I, th I think that alone that um, they denied and, and my evidence about that was kind of not thrown out it was the 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 barrister tried to belittle what i was saying um uh, and it, it didn't go too well for him actually but you know i think when people s look at it and go right well the intelligence services have no idea what went on the cars was never found the security cameras were off there was motorbike scene going in there was this 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 quite Easily, you can start saying, hang on, what's going on here? And I think that's what's happened, really. Mm -hmm. I, I believe it was a tragic accident. But I believe I believe that there are people that knew what went on in that tunnel, and I don't think we'll ever know. And you know what, as well, you know, James, you know, the sec our secret people are secret, and they don't want to be, we don't want people to know what they do, because they look after us, they look after the country, they look after our safety, and they do an amazing job. So I get it that they that they can't say that they're in certain places, and I understand why, and and thank God that they're there to look after us all. But um, I I think it may have even been the French, but I, I do believe the people in there, and I believe it was the people on the motorbikes. That's just my gut feeling because I'd stopped two guys in Saint Tropez, so <clears throat> we're whizzing through Saint Tropez. And I say whizzing, we're not we're not speeding. Let's just. Um, let everybody understand that they see bodyguards whizzing around in cars and all the rest of it and speed kills and if you speed into an ambush you go into an ambush quicker so you, you that's that's you know that's for hollywood so we we're driving down and so we had a convoy of vehicles and we'd sent a couple of cars out before so the paparazzi didn't know you know they might have followed one and said they're not in that one or they're not in that one it's all black black tack windows so the convoy goes down this, and we go down this narrow road, just enough to get a car down, maybe a foot and a half each side. And I was in the last car, it was my plan, my master plan. So we were in the back car, an armoured car. And 
as we got down this narrow road, we stopped our armoured, opened the doors. So even if they pushed against us, they'd push the doors back open on themselves onto the wall. You know, they couldn't get past. And anyway, there's two guys came down on, on different motorbikes. The paparazzi were generally on mopeds and things like this. It's a couple of high powered motorbikes dressed in a way that ex-military would dress in. And they spoke to us in a way that ex-military would speak to us. Yeah, you're right, lads. Um, are you going to let us pass Mucca? Which is a military term. And we said, lads, you know, we can't do that. They said, yeah, we thought you'd say that. Anyway, cheers anyway, lads, and just drove off. No cameras, nothing. So my understanding of that was they were obviously watching the princes and the princess, and why wouldn't they be? So MI5, MI6 were watching yeah, you as well. Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, you've got, you've got the... You've got Harry and William, one of them is going to take over as king, as, as the monarch. Could you imagine just sending two policemen out into that shit show? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Imagine the prince saying, who's with my boys? Well, we've got two policemen. Mm -hmm. See, when they left the Ritz, why was there only like one bodyguard with them and none of them had seatbelts on? Was that... Always the case, not have seatbelts on in case you were under attack yeah. as quick as to leave or should have had their seatbelts on as well. They should have had the seatbelts on, yeah. And uh, Trevor had his on. but Is it, that it, why he's the only one survived? Yeah, yeah. It's. Um, I think that's... Trevor can't remember anything about it, by the way. He's just lost his memory on that. And uh, yeah, that must torment him. And I remember he said to me, Lee, and I, when I carried him out of the golf buggy to see Dory's grave, and he's my size, big guy, but he just lost so much weight. He was horrendously injured. And he says, this is the biggest thing that's happened in the world. He said, I was there and I can't remember anything of it. You could see it was disturbing him, you know, it was very emotional. And because it's such a fast moving environment, people say, you know, Sending the decoy car out, you know, was really bad policy, but, you know, and not having a backup car for when they moved. But you could only call the shots if you're there, right? And we did do one vehicle moves. We did do one vehicle moves um, on occasion for whatever reason, because this is, this is private security. This, this isn't, uh, this isn't police, police yeah, or yeah. military, you know, so, you know, you've got to compromise and you've got to compromise with the clients as well because they've got their needs. You know, they pay the bills. So you don't know what happened, but Dodie didn't like wearing his seatbelt. He was known for it. He hated putting his seatbelt off and he would kick off. And uh, he did that with me once, the first time I drove him. And um, I said to him, look, um, so you put your seatbelt on, please. And he said, no, I don't wear my seatbelt. I said, I'm not starting the car till you do. And you're late for your dad. And he says, I'm not putting my seatbelt on. I said, right, okay. Next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to call your father. You can explain to him. And he, and he put his seatbelt on. Because Mr. Fayed, one of his big rules was everybody must wear a seatbelt. He, he was really big on it. And it's so tragic that it was that that killed his son, something his father, you know, if, if you were driving the kids without a seatbelt on, you'd get sacked. Because his dad said, just stay here. Like, and then they wanted to leave at such a late time. Like, because their route changed as well. Yeah. Even going under that bridge, it shouldn't have, yeah. have happened. Yeah. Like, why was that route changed, do you know? I don't know. I don't know. It's it's one of those things, it's such a fast-moving environment, you know, James, that uh, unless you were there, everybody's got an opinion on it, everyone. Mm -hmm. But unless you were there at the time, Trevor can't remember... Um, Kez has got his opinions on things but had the crash not happened we wouldn't be having this conversation yeah you know so it's just it's just a, an awful thing that happened because when in the bridge I think seven of the paparazzi got to jail they get charged yeah and was, then they got released yeah. because the guy the, the driver is it Henry Paul Henry yeah. Paul um, they then saying that he was drunk and then put the blame on to him, like you say, yeah. in the house. This is for the outsider. Like you say, it's, if you're MI5, they're going to cover up everything that nobody needs to know. But for the outsider, who then blamed him and says he was drunk, and then they've done the blood test and says, yeah, it was blood in his system or there was yeah. pharmaceutical drugs, yeah. to then that getting overturned 11 years later, I think, whatever, and says that it wasn't drunk. Yeah, it's, I think with the bloods, I think the, the French weren't... I, I don't know. You, if you want to prove something about anything, you get enough experts, you've got deep enough pockets, you can change opinion. 
on anything. So there's that many experts there and all the rest of it. But I think the the way the, the police handled that evidence gathering left a lot of questions to be answered, I think, by the, the way they did it. And without getting into it, I don't know the toxologist and, uh, you know, the, carb the carbon dioxide in his blood was a big issue. They said it came from the airbag. I just don't know. I'm not an expert in that. But what's interesting is at the end, because they took blood from different parts of his body, and it, and it absorbs quicker in different parts and dissipates quicker, they, they can they can kind of say, well, you know, he had, I think it was twice the legal limit. So what's the legal limit then? I don't know. I'm not, it's not my bag, this. Let's say it was a pint and we had two. We've had two, two pints, he had four. So he wasn't, and you can see on the pictures, he wasn't staggering drunk. He was expect, but he was made out to be pissed out of his head. And Trevor said to me, and I, and Kez has said to me as well, he was not drunk. We would not allow him to drive. Why would you? Why would you allow somebody pissed to drive? And they were both sober, by the way. Uh, Kez was a former police officer, a police a Royal Marine police guy, so he was used to dealing with drunks and stuff. And and I think it was just it was just a horrible accident that I think that our intelligence services or the French were there and they should have been there. I wouldn't expect them not to have been there. And I think somebody's gone, shit, we can't be seen to be here. And I think that caused a catalog of things which allowed the conspiracy theorists to jump on the bandwagon. Mm -hmm. So you think they've had to cover that up because MI5 are going to be watching, like you say, it's the future King's mum or it's Diana, and yeah. so they think they've been following you anyway. It's just happened. The paparazzi's crashed into them. Let's they've, get out of they've here died. Quick. They've got out of there, but then the cover-ups with the speed camera wasn't working. The cameras were off um, because it, it was a white Fiat. Yeah, you know, yeah. it was a paparazzi man, but there was marks on the side. Yeah, but again, it's because I think the ambulance was like an hour, two hours to get Diana to the it, hospital, yeah. and that stopped twice. I know. So when you put it all together. It's a fucked up, isn't it? It is. It's all fucked up, and 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 people who are far more intelligent than me come mm -hmm. up with these conspiracy theories. I do, I just think it was an accident. I think it was an accident. I think we had people there at government level, whether it's MI6 or the French or or whoever, that uh, saw what happened and just had to bug out there quick. Yeah, because I think it's Eric Patel as well. He was the only witness there, but they never used his evidence either. It's. So there's a lot of question marks everywhere, but yeah, because I think as Al Fayed, he believes that his son was killed. Yes, he does. Yeah, and he was. It uh, it 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 tore him apart massively, and the whole family, and 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 living through that, you know, this is what people don't understand that, that, that Dodi died, his son, you know, the brothers of these children. So we went through with I went through that all the whole thing with the family. You know, and uh, and grief is grief, isn't it? And then the princess obviously died. It was such a sad time for the, for her family. But uh, yeah, it was interesting that she told me that she'd gone to the highest level in government and asked them to to create a bill to get the pap to to calm this down. And and she was told in no uncertain circumstances, no, we're not going to do it. And she said, I, she said, I didn't cry in front of them. I waited till I got back in my car to cry. Yeah, but was that not Tony Blair that never done that? She wanted to take away the paparazzi or get security, but Tony Blair signed it to say no. But yet he was speaking at a funeral. I know. That's fucked up, isn't yeah, it? Why up. did that happen? When I saw that, I was like, this is fucked up. Yeah. But hey. And uh, she said to, to her, well, if I take the paparazzi off you, they're going to come for me. How fucked up is that? Who said that? The princess. But who said that to her? Tony Blair? Yeah. So he says, if I take the paparazzi on you, they'll come at me? Yeah. My government. Fuck. Mate, she was so upset when she was telling me. You know, and I don't have an opinion on Tony Blair. I don't have an opinion on the government. I'm, I'm, I can only say what I heard and, and what I saw. And that's it. But, um, and people are people, aren't they? At the highest level, people are normal people, and they're in they're in it for their own agenda. What they can get out of it, yeah. mad isn't it? Yeah. Fucking mad, mate. Sad as well, man. It's like, sad, yeah. But 
there's just so much speculation around that because there's still spe- especially the 25th year anniversary yeah. that, and there's still never been answers but like you say that higher archy higher power you're never going to get the answers and that's why they're all the speculation because who says what's right or what's wrong you don't really know because there was never an inquest either which should have been is that not law that if a British person passes away over abroad then there should be an inquest if there's speculation around the death yeah and I, there's so much I've, I've spoken to very very senior policemen about this and and they have their opinions and you know I, I don't kind of trouble my mind with that it's just like the JFK thing very same isn't it very I know that was you know he was short I get that but I think when when the the criminal trial went on and years and years later you had the coroner's inquest two different things but I think that set the president's that criminal trial that went ahead. And then when the coroner's inquest went went on, uh, I had two people from Scotland Yard here. They stayed here for three days, questioned me, for three days. And uh, they were great guys, by the way. And I think had that level of inquest had gone on at the first trial, various things might have unfolded differently. Yeah, because but you never know. The tunnel as well, they'd open that up four hours after the crash. Jet cleaned it, jet washed it. And then you've got Prince Harry saying that he had to leave because he didn't want to end up like his mum. Mad, eh? Do you know what I mean? And it's sad, like, there's so much madness goes on. But again, it's for the human mind, it's still, you're intrigued by it. 25 years, yeah. years later, we're still talking about that. I know. What would your full rundown be on it all? And your own professional manner. Yeah, I think I think it's it, it's an incident that happened, and and they'll be talking after it long after we've we've gone. But uh, I think uh, some people make their their living out of it, don't they? To Princess Diana and 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 regurg- I mean, you get. I think that's why I've been on so many shows and this all over the world because people love the princess. They still do. If they can get her picture on the front of their magazine. It sells that magazine like crazy or that newspaper. So she's still people, you know, the people's princess. And uh, and people just loved her. And people, you know, it's just crazy, isn't it? Yeah, there was rumours that she was pregnant. Is there any? We, we did a sweepstake to see if she was because we looked and we were like, she's not pregnant, but you never know. So we did a bit of a sweepstake. Yeah. yeah. But uh, no, we didn't. She didn't show any signs of being pregnant. Uh, but and again, if a female was pregnant at that at a young um, young stages or early stages, you wouldn't you wouldn't know. Where did you hear the news that she had passed away? So I'd I, I'd got I'd, where I'd been. I'd been somewhere. I'd, I'd gone back. I'd, I'd been. I think I was actually back in San Tropez. Yeah, I was. I went back to San Tropez for a couple of weeks, and it was like a walk in the park, man. Because it was just the family there. I was like, yes, this is brilliant. Um, and I came back home. I think I, I think I slept for a couple of days. And then I had a barbecue at my house and invited all my family around. And on this one particular night, I uh, I started to clean up. It might be near midnight, of course, which I never do. I, I just go to bed, you know. And I don't know why I did it then. I had Sky News on. And I heard it on Sky News. And I went to my phone I see I'd missed loads of calls. So I called the op- operations room, the ops room. And then I was getting a rundown real time of what was happening, you know, before it even hit the news. Because I thought, uh, I packed my bag and stuff because I thought I was going to have to go back into work, you know, um, which I, I, I didn't have to do actually, which uh, which was a blessing really because I think it was very upsetting for the guys there going over to, you know, Paris and doing all that stuff. And I went back about two weeks later when all the funerals and that were, was going on, all that kind of stuff. You know, it's incredible. The mm-hmm. outpouring of grief was just insane. Millions and millions of mourners. Millions. How was it for you? Did you ever feel like if you were there, you could have saved it from happening? As, as a guy who protects, like you'd always feel as if you would protect the person you're with, but did you ever get sleepless nights that what if you were there? No, no, I didn't, you know, because I just accepted the fact I wasn't there. You, can't, you can only fix what you can fix, right? So I, I know um, some people have, but I, I certainly didn't. Mm-hmm. So Trevor Reese Jones, who was a friend of yours, yeah. he was only survivor in the crash. Yeah, yeah. How long after the crash did you get to see him? So <clears throat> I 
he he came out of hospital and it was weeks later and he came down to the family home and and um Mr. Fire had built like this beautiful thing, you know, in memory of his son. Uh and it's probably about half a mile from the from the actual house, but in the grounds, you know. Uh so I took Dodie and uh, we used to have a a tennis you know the tennis buggies uh, you know, they use on the tennis tennis courts. And that's tennis, what I'm saying. Golf. Golf, what am I talking about? My head's flipping whizzing. <laughs> uh, uh, golf buggies. And I, I drove Trevor around. And, you know, when you see somebody and you think, fucking hell, I don't know you. His face was fucked, man. And he'd lost, he must have lost three, four stone weight. So I, I kind of picked him out of the car and, and held him to the thing. And he was just like, it was like a, 90 year old man you know how much trauma he'd had and that's when you know when i when i spoke to trevor and he was very emotional so was i but uh yeah i've seen him since and uh yeah he's a great guy real, real professional guy mm -hmm. and i you know if somebody was to say look you, you somebody's gonna look after your family i would choose trevor because he's, he's such a good bloke, you know. How hard is that to see a brother suffer like that? Like, on a job, trying to protect people, but then the effects it has yeah. on the people who do protect. It is. It's, 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 uh, it, it, the more you see it, James, the more you're okay with it. You know, a lot of my friends, you know, quite a few of my friends have killed themselves. And and when you're trying to help them through it, you know, the self-medicating, with, with which we all have with various things. And it's so sad that really proud men men's men can crumble like that and kill themselves how fucked up is that yeah it's sad isn't it mm. yeah so after that the death of diana and doddy that like, you're supposed to go to america change your life looking after yeah. the princess and her, and her man that like, after that happens then what's the steps for your life then did you totally transform it in a different lifestyle yeah. or did you just stay close protection yeah it, 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 uh, that was one of the biggest changing points in my life so what happened then was the family you know they were in mourning um some of the security guys left uh some got posted to different places and i went back out to santa Tropez for a few months uh, to look after the villa there and the guy who was looking after i think his dad had died or something and he had to go so I volunteered to go there, and it was it was good, really. It was just a, a couple of months of just um, chilling out, really. So uh, what the, 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 the rich people of the world, in all their places all over the world, they'll generally have a security person there that they can trust, you know, just keep an eye on it. So after that, there was a place, a vacancy came in um, a place called, a village called Rolls Hall, which is near Lairg. In the middle of Scotland, in the middle of, it's in the middle of the country, this tiny little village. Because Mr. Fire there, he's got his castle and he's got all his hunting and fishing estates about another hour north of that. And uh, the lad that was there, the security lad, he had to, he was moving somewhere, London or something. So I spoke to my mate, Paul Hanley Greaves, who gave me the job and I knew he was leaving. And I said, Paul, send me there i want to go there but not only that i wanted to get my boy damon because he was struggling with his mother uh he was getting a bit out of control she couldn't handle him so i thought right if he can come with me i can look after him and sort him out square him away and uh, so he said no um the boss won't let won't let you do that i said he'll never know will he I've been out in Saint Tropez now. I'm off his radar. Just send me there, and I badgered him. And he said, "For fuck's sake, Lee, right, go." So I went there. My boy came to live with me, but uh, Damon was probably about eleven then, and uh, I was living there. You know, Tom Selleck. You know, the Magnum. I was like the Magnum of the Highlands, mate. Hunting, fishing. It was great. Just getting into the community. There's just one pub, a few houses, doing things in the community, and. Uh, Obviously, look, keeping an eye out on his estate, and then we had a security team in the castle, which I didn't go to. And then, uh, so I'm just living the life of Riley there, having a great time. And 
what what happened then was I went down to the castle. Um, I think the family were coming up to stay. We had a big meeting, like we always did. And I then, uh, there were some members of the Guinness family coming in to come up to the estate where I lived and the security team used to ferry VIPs about, you know. But they were too busy preparing for the fired family coming. So I said, look, I'll do it. I'll do the trip. So I go down to pick uh, um, the, the Guinness family up and I met Kate there, who's now my wife, and the plane was delayed and we got talking in the airport. It's a tiny airport in Inverness then, tiny little airport. And we got chatting and uh, I got the Guinness team in and one of the CEOs of one of his companies was there, Mark he was called, and I got them together and I says, Mark, I says, I hope you don't feel like this is unprofessional. I says, see that lady over there? He went, yeah. I said, I've just got to go and get a number. Is that okay? And he went, yes. He says, come on, go for it, son. So. I got Kate's number, and then we met, uh, and then and then we we started seeing each other. Went to Ibiza, had a great time there. Came back, and then and then Mr. Fired visited, so he came up to Rolls Hall, and he had a little shop there that he gave the village rent free, so they could have stuff there and people could make some money. And I thought, shit, I've got to stay out of the way. So he was there, my cottage was opposite, and one of the boys came over and said, Lee, the boss wants to see you and your boy. I said, okay. We go over, he buys my boy everything in the shop, <laughs> and he says to me, uh, he says, uh, Lee, what are you doing here? <laughs> and I said, I've been here for like 18 months. And he went, no, 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 you come, come down to London and work with me and my family, and the boys like you. And I said, Mm. I said, I've got my boy here. He's in school. I said, no, I'll get your house. We'll put, we'll put him to school. We'll sort all that out. And that was the change then because I didn't want, I didn't want that for him. I didn't want him to grow up in that lifestyle. And I was happy there. And I just met Kate. So I left. I left employ the employment of the Fire family then. So was he going to put your kid through a private school with his own Everything. sons and a big house in London? Did you see though, your son, your son struggling because the father figure wasn't around. Yes, yeah, that's why I brought him back because mm -hmm. he's a very strong-minded guy. Then, I mean, you see the stuff he's done in sport and that at the highest level. Uh, you know, he's 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 one of these guys. He gets something in his brain. He's going to do it, man. So Same as he, yourself, though. Sorry. Same as yourself. Yeah, yeah, pretty much, pretty much. And we did that when he was seventeen, eighteen, big style. Because I didn't know what I know now, you know. Um, and we often talk about it. And uh, bringing up boys, you know, is difficult. And Kate, she she did a lot of research about bringing up boys and, and you know, the testosterone through those years. And once I began to understand it as a father, I sometimes think to myself, you fucked that right up, Lee. But you only know what you know, right? But now knowing what I do know with, with my boys now, my twins who are 11 and my boy who's 17, I can manage myself better and see to their needs rather than mine, you know. So it was a great lesson. Mm -hmm. But Damon and I were like best friends, you know. Yeah, so it was, a, it was a tough decision, but not a tough decision because you know you had your family here like, yeah. to leave the Al Fayed because you've worked with, you've not worked with Tom Cruise in that as well. Well, during the fi the Fayed years and after, I've worked with quite a few celebrities, but because uh, Dodie was into the film production, we, we'd have these people coming through all the time and we'd look after them and take them about and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and and that scene, I just don't like. It's not my bag. Some of them are very needy, extremely needy. Like who? <sighs> lots and lots of needy. But the best one, this is funny, Jean-Claude Van Damme, right? <laughs> Fucking hell, mate. I've nothing against the guy. I think he's actually quite good fun. But we, I've looked after him a couple of times with uh, Fayed when he came down. And he'd screw the nut with us because we were like Fayed's bodyguard team. And most people shit themselves when they came into our, because we were so professional. And most of the guys were about my size, you know, six foot two or something. And uh, all fit and uh, with bearing, you know. So it's, it's, we were quite, quite a good team. And so he'd just sit quietly in the car, put his makeup on, do whatever, whatever he, he had a big cocaine problem, which is, which is a problem a lot of people have and, uh, and it's well documented so I'm not kind of sort of saying stuff out of turn here so people have got to have their own space haven't they to put the makeup on to take the cocaine to do what they've got to do and you've got to work with them rather than put your opinions on them 
And that's why a lot of guys struggle in this uh, and, they, and they can't cope yeah. working with these people because they have opinions on their lives. And I say to my teams now, and I train teams all over the world now, and, and you know, I, I still work in security operations, but managing it now, that, you know, I say to people, how dare you have an opinion on anyone? We're here to keep them safe, not to have an opinion on their life, just make it right for them. Mm -hmm. So uh, Van Damme was coming over to do a Fly on the Wall documentary, right? And there was a friend of mine that was running it, and he was going to various locations doing various stuff. <clears throat> and I got a call, and he said, Lee, I need your help. And I says, what do you need, John? He says, I need some close protection for the Van Damme documentary I'm doing. I said, okay. I can help you. When's he coming? And he says, day after tomorrow. And I went, shit, you've got problems, mate. So I says, right, find me the, the itinerary. I'll see what it was. It was about a week. Uh, so I looked at the itinerary and I, I got, an, uh, I said, right, mate, he's not going to get in that helicopter. He's only got one engine. He's not going to go there. He's not going to go there. He won't go there and he won't do that. He said, well, he's got to. He's contracted to. I says, no, he's not, mate. He's a superstar. He'll do what the fuck he wants. I says, so, you, you're gonna have to take that out and and take that out. And I said, it's, it's a bit of it's gonna be a bit of a nightmare for you. So he says, right, I need security. So I got one guy I knew, God bless him, very good friend of mine, Rock. And if you're listening to this, Rock, I love you, man. So he's one of the hardest men I've ever met in my life. He's fucking nails. Great CP operator, not the best at organising. Right. So I put him on the job. I put my friend Jack Morley, who's died, God bless him, ex-Scotland uh, international foot, uh, rugby player. He played rugby for Scotland, cricket for Scotland, and he did kickboxing for Scotland. Great guy, huge monster of a man, very intelligent. He did, he did some great stuff um, in, in his life and in his career. So I put Jack down to look after Rock. I put Rock there to look after Van Damme, and, then, and I put a team around them, okay? So... He's the waiting at the airport in Birmingham for him to, to fly in. He's not on the flight. He's flown from Hong Kong. He's not on the flight. Rock's on this. We've lost. I said, you can't lose him. We've not even picked him up yet. Fucking find him in the airport. He says, he's not on the flight plane. I've checked the itinerary. He's not there. I've been airside. He's not here. I'm like, shit. What are we going to do? Nobody could contact his PA because she was in the air flying on a different flight. So that, so... Rock stood outside the airport thinking, what the fuck are we going to do? All of a sudden, this car pulls up. Van Damme gets out, goes, cheers, mate. He'd hitched a lift. He'd gone to the wrong airport. His flight was to the wrong airport. He'd hitched a lift from London to Birmingham. Check that. How funny is that? So he gets out and, 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 the, and the show goes on. And it's drama after drama because he wouldn't change the itinerary. So he's, he's got to get a shower in between appearances, hasn't he? He's got to take his flipping cocaine. <laughs> He's got to put his make. He's got to have time to do that. And in the end, they're in this big show in London and he's just come from this event and my mate's there, he's about his size and he's got his tux on and all the rest of it. Van Damme walks in, mad as bollocks, with his sweaty shirt on that he's just been doing a, some kind of martial arts demo, goes into this place and he throws the shirt at my mate. He says, give me the fucking tux. So he had to give him the talks, and he sat there at this dinner with a sweaty T-shirt on a pair of joggers, laughed my head off. But uh, but I think it was about three days in, Jack, my friend, he says, Lee, we've got a big situation down here. I says, what? He says, Van Damme's been an absolute dick. Rock's going to fucking kill him. He's going up to his room now to fucking smash him. I'm like, stop him now. We won't get paid. <laughs> so I said, get him on the phone. I talked him down. He said, I'm going to fucking kill him. I said, no, you're not. I will not pay you if you fucking <laughs> smash up the VIP. And I talked him down, thank God. Rock, thanks, mate. Yeah, that's that. not good for business. Fucking hell. So what is life like now, like working with the biggest names on the planet? Like Being through a bit of trauma yourself, a bit of pain, yeah. from being bullied to being an eighth dan. Like, it's an unbelievable career and stories, but how's life like now? Yeah, life's really good. Life is really good. We've got our martial arts that we do. That's our passion. I've got various um, things going on in in uh, in um, Somalia. We've got some stuff going on in Saudi. We've got some stuff. We're waiting for um, Mali to quiet down a bit. We've got some some, some work there. I do um, organise close protection for VIPs, and I'm very choosy who I who I touch now. 
So they've got to fit my criteria as, as well as me fit in theirs. So I've got some great people I work with that look after people. I've got a, a, a cost protection training school that we're just about to launch in Spain, which is super exciting. Uh, so we've got all that going on. And uh, we do a lot of work with the community here. We work with uh, challenged children. We work with um, kids who have opted out. You know, some of it we do for free. Uh, some of it my, my team get paid for. So that's nice looking after some, some of these kids. They've just been forgotten by the system. I could cry for them, you know. And you look at them and you think, fucking hell, what's happened to you? Mm -hmm. Where, where where are you going to go? I know where they're going to go, some of these kids. And so it's it's really fulfilling working with them. You know, I'm, I think I'm going out to Birmingham to work with uh, some kids who are in gangs. I love doing that because, you know, if you, if you go in to see some of these kids as a tough guy, a kickboxer, bodyguard, all that, you can speak to them in a different way. To say, look, I've been where you are, where you I've been. I, I went from school, I didn't take my exams or anything. I took a couple of exams, walked away. I hardly went to school in the later years. And and a lot of my friends, you know, some of my friends off the council estate, you know, died of drugs and all the rest of that kind of stuff. So I, I know what it's about. So when you can talk to them, like we're chatting now and say, look guys, come here, there's a different way. There is a different way to do this. And I'll tell you my story. And if it just inspires some of them to go, you know, I'm big on affirmations. I write it in the book, you know, uh, meditations and affirmations, and it can change your life. And for some of these kids, you know, uh, there was one kid, and and uh, he was one of the last visits I did, and uh, we'll do six at maximum, because some of these kids, they, they, they can't even speak to you. And, you know, they've all got issues. And one kid, he had this really deformed leg, and he had lots of issues. And I said to him, like, well, let's, well, I'm going to show you how to do affirmations now so you can be the best that you can be at whatever you want to be. At. One kid wanted to be a joiner, but he knew he was shit. Everyone told him he was shit. He was thick. He, you know, uh, these kids are lost. So so we start to tell them, look, right, let's make a little life plan for you. Let's set some affirmations that you can say to yourself, because you are good, you are special. There's only one of you in the world, one of you and you can be whatever you want to be. And this kid, they were, so they're all kind of saying what kind of jobs they want to do or what they'd like to do or maybe go to college, but they haven't got the, they've got nothing. So this kid says, I want to get married. This kid's only 16, 15. And I said, well, what, what's the issue, mate? And he says, everyone told me nobody will marry me. Look at me, look at the fucking state of me. I'm mad. Yeah, it's sad, isn't it? Some kids being set. Yeah. So I, 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 I spent about, I don't know, half an hour with him, telling him all the good points he had, all the good stuff he had in his life. And you, you, you see, like, the cloud lifts. And this kid goes, I can't get married, can't I? I said, fucking right you can, mate. Now, yeah. let's, what else do you want to do? Try to gain a bit of belief into him. Yeah, yeah. Where can people buy your book, Lee? So uh, you can buy it online, Amazon. How was it writing the book? It was it was it, it was interesting, uh, and it it took me back to dark places that I didn't really want to go back to, you know, because in the book there's there's two occasions when there's lots of occasions where it's been close where I nearly died, and you you make peace mm -hmm. with yourself, and I know we were talking about it earlier in those situations. Um, the the Somalia one was fucking horrendous, but the one in Libya just took it to a next level, one of them. And so we're standing too on the roof of this fucking place and everyone's in their stand two positions because we think we're going to get attacked. And you're speaking to your mates that you've worked with closely, you know, I think it was four or five of us. And we knew that uh, ISIS wanted to grab, grab us and obviously behead us. Like, you know, it's a normal format for them, isn't it? You know, put in the orange jumpsuit and fuck you up. And that would be a worst nightmare, wouldn't it? So we're we're talking to each other, like we're talking rationally, right, guys? The guy who was in charge of the ammunition, the dick, didn't order enough ammunition. So we only had about three magazines each for our rifles, maybe two magazines for our pistols. Went to the armory and said, right, break out the ammunition. He says, that's it. You're like, you fucking asshole. So we're on the roof deciding who was going to shoot who. 
with your last rounds. But 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 not in a, a frightened way, in a real cool, clear way. Because in those situations, you know, you, you're worrying about yourself, your ego, your bills, your this. Then you worry about nothing. Everything is clear. The clarity of mind is insane. You've said goodbye to everybody, yourself. You, obviously, I didn't say it to Kate or phone anybody up. But you've made your peace. You've left your video. You've done all that. Now I can get on with this shit. Now I, I can start working. And it's that, that, and that feeling of clarity is very similar to combat sport times by about a million. And once you've felt it a couple of times, it's, it's a comfortable place to be in. That's mad, isn't it? Yeah. Crazy. So, so see, if you're under attack and you know you're going to a war zone, do you have to do a video before for your family to say you love them? Uh, I don't, but what I do is when I go away, I always do a journal. So I'll either do a video journal or I'll do a journal and I, I write my stuff in there. And uh, one day I'll sit and watch them with Kate. But um, but what you do on some of the, well, a lot of the jobs is you do a proof of life thing. So I, I write down everything about my, my life and Kate writes as well you know, the different, different things that we know, only she knows that I know. And we'll have our things that if they have to prove I'm alive, they will come to Kate and go through my proof of life and they'll ask questions to establish if I'm alive. So imagine Kate going through that. Just that alone is fuck, nails, isn't it? Yeah, it's madness. Just before we finish up, brother, for any, I know you're big on mental health and that. I know you've lost friends through mental health. I know you've battled yourself sometimes with mental health. For anybody that's maybe struggling themselves, what advice would you have for them? It's, it's, it's tough. It's tough, James. You know, the government saves us help out there. There's not enough. Um, but th th it's a start. It is a start. Now, people with mental health issues, this is what I would say to a lot of people, is look, you can turn this shit around. There's there's books out there you can buy, and it might sound a bit crap, but you can take ownership of it. You can go in search of things, read about inspirational people who've been in the same situation as you. Look how they've done it, and and take be proactive. You don't have to lie back and say the government shit. They're not helping me. Well, yeah, okay, we get that. Now, what are you going to do about it as a person? Come on, fucking get out there. As dark as it may seem. Just try one thing and see, because there's there's not a lot of help out there. People are lost, aren't they? When you you know, when you're down that dark place where you don't give a fuck whether you die or not, you just really don't care, and you can't get out of it, and you and you you want to get out of it, but you know what's happening, and you just go down that fucking tunnel, right? And and it's got to be at some stage you've got to go fucking stop. Let me get something positive in my life now, whether it's a video, whether it's a song, whether it's something, and just start that proactive thing of you standing up there and going, you know what? I can fucking beat this shit. Yeah, that's amazing. Mm. Lee, for coming on the day, brother. I thoroughly Cheers, enjoyed brother. that. I'll leave the link in the description for your book as well. But great story, mate. I wish you all the best for the future. Thank you. God bless you. Great seeing you.